So like I mentioned, we are continuing in this sermon series, Cross-Examination. And last week, Pastor Tom kind of kicked it off and and laid out how there's this trial going on. and, And first he laid out who are the prosecutors in the trial? Who are the ones bringing the charges, the, the plaintiffs. And, and so it was kind of a surprising realization, not the people maybe you would think of, in that it's the religious leaders and one of Jesus' close friends that are actually bringing these charges against him. But now tonight we're going to be looking at who the witness is. Who, who are the witnesses in this trial? Now if you uh, follow any, maybe you watch uh, court Uh, movies or any legal movies or whatnot, Uh, a witness, you know, is someone who is called to the stand and is kind of tasked with telling the truth of what happened, right? You, you, You tell the account of what you know. And it seems like being a witness should be a pretty easy thing to do. You just get up there, and you say what you know, and then you sit down. There's, you know, there's, there's not a, a lot you have to do there. It seems like it should be such an easy thing. But being a witness starts to actually be really difficult, especially when there is a cost involved. This reminds me of a movie. Uh, I'm sure so many of you know it. Youth, I'm sorry, this was uh, before you were born. Uh, movie, A Few Good Men. Who has seen the movie, A Few Good Men? Any youth? Okay, there we go. Nice job. A Few Good Men. Uh, it's, it's a great movie, and it's in A Few Good Men. There's this trial going on where these two Marine officers are, are put on trial, being accused of murdering one of their fellow soldiers. And kind of the main character, Lieutenant Caffey, he's this young lawyer, and he's charged with defending these two officers. And the tension's building throughout the movie until finally it kind of hits its climax where Lieutenant Caffey calls Colonel Jessup to the stand. And he is the colonel who's over those officers. And Lieutenant Caffey suspects that the colonel was actually the one that ordered the code red. A code red was kind of this unofficial disciplinary hazing that led to the death of the soldier. And so he suspects this. And so he calls him to the stand as a witness. And it's a really tense scene. I mean, they start to have this back and forth. It gets, it gets heated. And the Colonel Jessup, he, he says to him, you want answers? And, and the lawyer, Lieutenant Caffey, responds, I want the truth. And then what's the line that he responds with? It's a classic. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> Love it. Such a good line. See, being a witness for him was really difficult because telling the truth, telling what happened, came with a cost. And that cost for him was pretty severe. It was owning responsibility for the death of this individual. Well, we're looking at this trial of Jesus, and Jesus here is going to be arrested and put on trial and charged with capital punishment. And if you're thinking, if you're in Jesus' shoes, you want the best witnesses possible to defend you. And I just want you to kind of maybe think about this for yourself. If you were uh, being put on trial for something that you were innocent of, who in your life would you go to to be your witness? That person that knows you best and can give the best testimony about you. Well, for Jesus, I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's the disciples. The disciples here, they've been with Jesus the entire journey, right? They, they, they've been following Jesus and they've witnessed so many incredible things. They saw him multiply food and feed thousands of people. They've seen him heal people of sicknesses and disease. They've even seen him raise someone from the dead. They've witnessed so many incredible things. And the disciples should have story after story that they could give as to why Jesus isn't just innocent, why really he should be the last person being put on trial, being charged with capital punishment. Being a witness for the disciples should have been so easy. Peter thinks it will. You see, when 
Jesus has just celebrated the, the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and they's, they're heading out to the Mount of Olives, and this is kind of where our reading picks up. It reads here, On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now I want you to just put yourself in the disciples' shoes here. You've been following Jesus here pretty much most of your life now. You've been, you, you abandoned your old career, your old livelihood, and they are, all, I mean, they're not, they're not just, you know, lax days ago. They are all in committed following Jesus. And now Jesus all of a sudden says, you're just going to desert me? The disciples have to be thinking, why in the world would we do that? We've given up everything to follow you. Why would we all of a sudden desert you? And we hear this in, in Peter's response. Peter says, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. I love how Peter like subtly is throwing all of his friends under the bus. He's like, yeah, th they might all desert you. Not me, Jesus. Not me. So Peter has a tendency to uh, kind of give that, give that vibe. That person in the friend group that's always, uh, you know, trying to show how, how cool they are or whatnot. But Jesus responds to Peter, says them, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. Blowing Peter's mind. And Peter does kind of the unthinkable. He challenges Jesus and he responds, no. Yeah, don't try that. Don't tell Jesus no. He tells him no. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Being a witness for the disciples, it seems so easy. It was so easy to follow Jesus because there was no cost involved. But that quickly shifted, right? Later that night when Jesus is betrayed, he's arrested, he's, he's put on trial. And now suddenly these crowds are building up, crowds of people I'm sure the disciples know who are chanting, crucify him, crucify him. They're spitting on Jesus, they're beating him. They're wanting to take his life. And now I'm sure as the disciples, you're feeling the pressure. That pressure of, and, and, you know, what are people going to think of me if they hear I'm... I'm with Jesus. It, maybe they even feel their life being threatened. And we see this pressure happen with Peter. We see him start to feel the cost. It reads, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came over and said to him, You were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, You must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Now, you can hear the escalation in Peter's denial, right? Like, it's bad enough you were one of Jesus' closest friends in denying him. That's bad enough. But he raises the stakes. See, he denies Jesus again, this time with an oath. You know, I think about what does a witness have to do when they're called forward and, you know, placed on the stand, they have to put their hand on a Bible and say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's like Peter's doing that, but saying, I, 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 I vow that I do not know Jesus. But then he takes it to an even higher level. And he demands that a curse be brought down from God himself upon him if he is lying about being associated with Jesus. I mean, think about the irony there. The, the very God that he is denying being associated with is the one that he's calling out to saying to bring a curse down upon him. I mean, Peter totally blows it, totally fails as, as a witness for Jesus. Each one of us has been declared 
as witnesses of Jesus. The Bible says it. You are a witness to Christ in this world. It says that you actually are the primary way that people are going to see Jesus in this world. And so the question I want to extend is how are you doing as a witness for Jesus? I don't know about you, but when I hear that question, immediately all the ways I've blown it start coming to mind. All the ways where where God's given the opportunity, the moment, the chance to, to shine his light to someone, and I fail. Where I'm like Peter, and I completely act like I deny even knowing him. And the thing is for us, sometimes it doesn't even have to be that big of a cost, right? Sometimes it's just, what will people think of me? Right? Maybe you guys, you feel that. Like, what will people think of me if they hear I'm a Christian? Am I going to be judged for that? Right? You feel that cost. What will people say if I, if I pray for them right here in this moment? Will they be friends with me anymore? Will they judge me? If we're being honest with ourselves, oftentimes it's, it's the littlest of costs. When there's even the slightest of inconvenience, that's all it takes for us to be like Peter and to blow our chance of being a witness. And it can leave us in this place where we're like, Lord, we're the last people you should be looking to, to be your witness in this world. But here's the amazing thing about what Jesus does not only for Peter's story, but for your and mine, is Jesus doesn't give up on Peter. Right? Peter could have done all this and Jesus just left him. Kind of deserved it. But instead, Jesus goes to the cross for Peter. Not in spite of his denial, but because of it. He goes to the cross for you and for me, not in spite of the ways we have absolutely blown it, but because of it. And at the cross, Jesus, he makes this great reversal where now it's at the cross that he is our witness. You see, you realize the roles are reversed and before our heavenly father, we are on trial (laughs) When all we have to offer is our brokenness, our betrayal, the ways we have failed. And yet Jesus at the cross intercedes as our witness. And he, as he takes all of your sin and pays for it, now declares, you are holy. You are blameless. You are righteous. And here's the deal. We, we, we hear that and we think, okay, is Jesus just deceiving the Father To not actually see how messed up my life is. Because each one of us knows how broken we are. But I want you to think back to the very beginning in Genesis. Think to how God created everything. It was through his voice, right? God spoke and it happened. God's words are reality. So when Jesus speaks over you, you are forgiven. You are loved. You are my child. He's not just giving a suggestion. He is declaring your reality. A reality that no failure, no struggle, no matter how many times you mess up, you don't have the power to overcome that reality. That is yours. You you have a God who, who died on your behalf and now is advocating for you and declaring that you are righteous. And here's the incredible power in that is now as we go into the world, our primary witness, our primary witness is to go to people and say, man, I am broken. I I am so undeserving. Of Christ. I have failed him time and time again. And yet he still chose me. 
He declares me as holy. He declares me as righteous. And that's what I am. And the same that's true for me, it's true for you too. That is our witness to this world. And that's a message our world needs to hear. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oftentimes the things that fill our mind are the, are the ways that we failed you. We can see your love as something that feels conditional, where the, the further and further we fall, the more far away we feel. But Lord, you have transformed our reality. You have declared us as your sons and daughters. You have pronounced over us that we are righteous, we are holy, we are yours, an identity that cannot be shaken. So Lord, as we leave this place and as we continue to wrestle, let us be grounded in that truth. Let us never be torn down by Satan and his attacks to tell us that we are less than that, what you say we are. Remind us of that daily, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.